Um, but we're really happy to see all of you and we're really happy to be here today with David S. Reynolds and Harold Holzer. Um, we're gonna be discussing David's new book, Abe, which you can purchase by clicking on the link that is in the chat. Um, it's getting some great reviews, so you're definitely gonna to wanna to check that out. Um, and it's a great way to support our author and to also support politics and prose. Um, secondly, I'd just like to let everyone know that the latter portion of today's talk is gonna be devoted to your questions. And we really encourage everyone to ask a question and you can do so by clicking on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screens. Just click on that and you can ask your questions and see other people's questions. And uh, we'll try to get to as many of those as we can. And with that out of the way, um, it is my honor to introduce David S. Reynolds to Politics and Prose Live. He is a distinguished professor at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. He is also the author of Walt Whitman's America, a cultural biography, Beneath the American Renaissance, John Brown Abolitionist, and Mightier Than the Sword, Uncle Tom's Cabin and the Battle for America. He is also a regular book reviewer for the New Yorker Review uh, Book Books, the New York Times Book Review, and the Wall Street Journal. Today, he is here to discuss his new book, Abe, Abraham Lincoln and His Times. Many years in the making, this new biography is unique in that it examines the cultural and social forces, forces of Lincoln's time to better understand the 16th president. Lincoln, Reynolds argues, was very much a man of his time and his knowledge of contemporary American culture and his drive to transcend it was at the root of his greatness. Today, David will be in conversation with Harold Holzer. Uh, Harold is the recipient of the 2015 Gilder Lehrman Lincoln Prize. He is one of the country's leading authorities on Abraham Lincoln and the political culture of the Civil War era. He was appointed chairman of the U.S. Abraham Lincoln Bicentennial Commission by Bill Clinton and awarded the National Humanities Medal by President George W. Bush. He currently serves as the, as the director of the Roosevelt House Public Policy Institute at Hunter College, City University of New York. A book out called The Presidents vs. the Press. So uh, with that out of the way, um, please join me in welcoming David and Harold. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's uh, wonderful to be here with uh, David, who I haven't seen for months, but I see now on Zoom. And um, congratulations, David, on the fine notices for aid. Um, just a captivating and totally original look. I've spoken to people in the field, and we've all been saying, just when you think, everything has been written and nothing new can be written. Along comes 800 pages that show that that's not the case. So I have so much to get to before we take audience questions. So let me start um, by asking, um, for those who may not know, what is a cultural biography? And for that matter, what is a cultural historian? I know I'm speaking to one. Yes, cultural biography, uh is different from what I call standard biography. Standard biography follows uh, a person's life facts and fills in a little bit of the context, but really sticks pretty close to uh, the immediate context and with a few forays perhaps into the background. Uh, whereas a cultural biography assumes that we're all uh, indelibly uh, defi defined by both our immediate culture, but also by the larger culture, its values, its images. And uh, I take an Emersonian approach. Emerson believed that um, the greatest geniuses are the ones that are mo most open to the various cultural currents around them. And he says, culture is almost like the air that kind of seeps through the skin and, and infiltrates, uh, uh, even infiltrates the brain. And he said, of all the great heroes in history, Abraham Lincoln is the one who could span all levels of experience from the highest to the lowest until, as, Lincoln, uh, as Emerson said, until the, the very dogs believed in him, in him you know. So, uh, and so really, my, uh, there have been some marvelous uh, biographies, superb biographies of, of Lincoln. Um, but in one of the best single volume uh, biographies by David Donald, which is still a wonderful book, um, Donald says at the very beginning, you know, I'm seeing uh, Lincoln from his point of view. Uh, he frankly was not very involved in the social and, and cultural and political transformations around him and also he entered the presidency, in Donald's words, um, the least prepared 
uh, uh, person who ever entered the presidency because he had less than one year of schooling, uh, uh, virtually uneducated and everything, and he was totally self-made. And I try to say that actually quite, it's quite different from that. He was very, very much open to uh, culture on every level. He could uh, recite Shakespeare by the page. Um, he uh, learned uh, Euclidean ge uh, geometry by himself. And then when he was on the law circuit, traveling around Illinois, um, at the farms, he would stop and say, hey, how does that machine, that machine work? How, uh, what, what the brand of, of heifer or cow is that? Uh, and what kind of pig uh, is that and so forth. He, he was really interested uh, in, in very, very curious uh, on all levels of culture. And uh, so I show in my book um, that he was very, very, uh, he loved popular humor of the crudest variety, as well as he loved high poetry uh, by Robert Burns and by uh, Byron and Longfellow and the popular music of his day. He also attended opera. So I like to interweave um, the culture into uh, the biography of his, his life. Yeah, um, as, you, as, as we know, when he was in New York, he came close to going to Barnum's Museum, but he did go to the uh, New York premiere of Ballo and Mascara, so, uh, although he was criticized for wearing black gloves. Uh, but <laughs> yes, both cultures. So David, why, um, I don't think I've asked you this before, but so you've written about Whitman and John Brown and their impact on the culture and culture's impact on them. This is an inevitable question for anyone who tackles Lincoln. And I know you've edited a wonderful collection of Lincoln's writings, but why did you decide that it was time at this point in your career and, and the, the, the library of available Lincoln books why was it time for you to deal with Lincoln? Well, it was kind of funny because I wrote uh, a book for, book proposal on uh, the founding fathers, and I sent it. My agent sent it to publishers and so forth, and everybody liked it except one uh, publisher said, I, "I really like this paragraph on Lincoln. Why doesn't he write on Lincoln?" And I said, "Why don't I? Why don't I?" I said, "You know, in a sense, I've been preparing for this." my whole scholarly career because I've been studying, I've been immersed, totally immersed in the culture around him. And also Walt Whitman, for example, uh, was very close emotionally to Lincoln. Not that they knew each other, but they would see each other on the streets. And Whitman wrote beautiful poetry about him and a lot of prose and lectured on him. And so I've been kind of thinking for quite a while about uh, about Lincoln almost unconsciously. And finally, I said, it's really time. Um, and I reread some of, the bio, some of the great biographies and I realized that so much had been, had been left out. One can read a whole biography of, of Lincoln by somebody else and not encounter people like Harriet Beecher Stowe or, you know, or, or Fred, well, Frederick Douglass is usually there, but, uh, there are a lot of sort of uh, popular writers that are not there in the background mm -hmm. that were quite quite important for understanding Lincoln. So I, I think I know the answer to this, but I'm, people may be curious, um, especially since those who've read Donald and other books know that Lincoln hated being called Abe uh, to his face. Presumably he let his mother, his stepmother do it and his cousins uh, and stepbrothers, but you very, um, consciously called the book Abe. And I want to give you a chance to explain why, because I actually love the rationale. Yeah, um, he didn't like, uh, people who knew him, knew him well, knew not to call him Abe. He just didn't particularly like the name. However, uh, he said, I realized that I owe my presidency to, to the image of Abe, honest Abe, old Abe, Uncle Abe, Abe the Illinois, Illinois rail splitter. Um, he realized, he, he said, I was really elected on the cry of old Abe, on the, the uh, enthusiasm for old Abe. And that's how the masses, uh, the average people liked to think of him as, as old Abe or Uncle Abe, even though he never really looked 
that old or anything, but he had a, a, an approachable, sort of an everyman kind of persona. And he was portrayed that way in the popular press. And so he just kind of went, went along with it, even though the people around him knew, he really preferred, he didn't even, even prefer Mr. President. He actually preferred, at least to the, you know, for those close to him, Link, Lincoln, yeah, Lincoln. So and, and you 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 create the the dichotomy there with a very elegant uh, Brady Studio photograph uh, on the book jacket with the with the word Abe superimposed. Yeah, I, I've seen so many soldier letters where when Lincoln visits a camp, the soldiers say Uncle Abe was here. He's not as homely as he's said to be, or he's homely, <laughs> but, but it's Uncle Abe, and the connection was. And he did know. I mean, being called uh, Abe in the 1860 campaign was a useful diversion uh, from his supposed radical views on slavery. And, and so it was very useful to him. And I think you're right that he, that he, that he recognized it. So just, so t tell us about, before we get to the, the larger cultural forces that perhaps meant more to him when he was an a young adult than when he was a child, there's still the, well, as the song says, old Abe Lincoln came out of the wilderness, right? That was a song in 1860. But you have a slightly different take on the milieu. Um, you, it's been de-romanticized in the last generation of writing, I think, as disgusting and dirty and threatening and, uh, and his father as an oppressive, uh, unsympathetic uh, character who rented him out as a slave, uh, uh, didn't respect his learning at all. And you have a different take and I wanna give you a, certainly a chance to expound on it because it's pretty original. Yeah, um, most biographies, I think it's safe to say are pretty much anti Tom Lincoln, the father. And even some of the older films on Lincoln and so forth. Um, and he becomes kind of the straw figure uh, supposedly uh, well, he was barely literate. He wasn't uh, particularly well read. That's true. Uh, he may have once uh, uh, preferred, uh, said that he preferred uh, Lincoln to be at work in the fields rather than reading his book. True. But in general, uh, Lincoln looked pa back on what he called uh, to a close friend of his, a joyous, happy uh, childhood. Not that they ever had money because he was born in a single room log cabin. Uh, and um, um, they kind of scraped by, but his father managed to buy uh, quite large acreage in Kentucky uh, because of a uh, bad land uh, situ real estate situation there. He finally had to move away. Also, there was slavery in the area. So when Lincoln was nine, they moved to Indiana. But his father um, really among those who knew him and who were interviewed later by William Herndon uh, his father was, was called a good, upright, moral person. He didn't, wasn't a drinker or, any, or he drink just now and then or anything. He was a, a hard worker, a good worker. Um, and uh, this sense of enmity, I think it's true that later on when Lincoln becomes a lawyer and becomes kind of a more respectable person and so forth, he becomes maybe a little more alienated from his father who was living elsewhere in Illinois, but we can't really look. And as far as uh, working for his father and being a so-called slave, when you lived on the frontier, that was part of subsistence living because um, everyone in the household, if you were above the age of five or six, were expected to, to work, to contribute. Uh, so even little kids would do odd jobs and chores and everything around the house, that was just until you were age 21, that's, that's what people did. So um, I try to rehabilitate um, uh, Tom Lincoln and call him in many ways, kind of a good example, uh, um, along with the mother who dies early and the stepmother who really loved Abe, or the stepmother really loved Abe and, and he, he loved her a lot too. So it's a different kind of uh, childhood, I think uh, yeah. that we have to portray. Yeah. I always I always say that um, um, in 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 Tom's uh, favor, or at least uh, to evoke some sympathy, that uh, farmers of the day tried to have five sons and four daughters so they could 
all work. And uh, Thomas, whether he was sterile as some of his contemporaries <laughs> said or whatever, he only had three children in his life. One died in infancy, uh, the other died in childbirth, and then there was his son. So I guess much was expected in terms of supporting him in the fields. And I think that was probably yeah, and, uh, a little cause. And as late as, as late as 1900, um, American families had an average of around eight to nine kids uh, because kids were, you know, even later in the century were considered help helpers, you know, right. so, so uh, yeah. Um, so, uh, so, you know, yeah. I changed a little bit with the indolent uh, stepbrother coming aboard, but yeah, I think he, right. in his, and the other thing is that people are always saying that, uh, you know, Lincoln did not go to his father's deathbed and sent a rather uh, you know, unctuous prayer or, or best wishes on your flight to heaven. But he had actually visited during the last um, emergency that his father had undergone, allegedly to his deathbed, and it was a false alarm. And, you know, it wasn't that easy to get around in Illinois in 1850. So I cut him a break for that, too. So I, I, yeah. I liked your portrait. Not sure if I'm all the way there yet, but I'm... Mm -hmm. But it's food for thought, for sure. And then yeah. Thomas, that leads us into religion, because um, Thomas was a strong Baptist. It was probably the source of his anti-slavery, as well as, you know, envy of those who could have slaves. So why should I, sh I, why should I be disadvantaged? But tell us about Lincoln's religious upbringing and also the cultural forces that made him, at first, a uh, pretty radical questioner and ultimately helped him find a place in which he was comfortable with his with his relationship to God. That's well, a big question. Baptist, yeah, the Baptist uh, religion back then uh, was growing very, very popular. However, it was pretty much divided. Uh, somebody said you cannot use the word Baptist without a prefix like foot washing Baptist or regular Baptist, or this kind of Baptist, and so forth. And um, a small uh, uh, sect uh, broke off from the regular Baptist church, which was anti-slavery uh, in uh, the Little Mount Church in uh, Kentucky, where they were. And so uh, he happened to be listening to anti-slavery preacher, preachers, ministers, who was, that was kind of interesting. But he, uh, never joined a church. Um, he never formally joined a church, but, was, but, but he would enjoy as a youngster going to sermons, to Baptist sermons, and later on uh, biographers would say he really learned a lot from these pre preachers, the way they addressed their audience, quite often in a vernacular uh, style, and telling jokes and humor and that kind of thing. And he really learned, uh, in a way, the art of persuasion uh, to some degree from, from them. And he would like to get up on a stump and preach. And uh, he would literally memorize the sermon or virtually memorize the sermon that he had heard. And he would get up and preach and, enter, and then uh, read from the Bible a little bit. And of course, he, he loved reading the Bible. Uh, although uh, his mother said he actually his stepmother said he didn't read the Bible quite as much as people said, but he, he got imagery from the Bible. He thought it was a wonderful guide. At the same time, um, he did go through a phase in the 1830s when he was in his 20s, and he read Thomas Paine and other free, th free thinkers, and he actually wrote a little pamphlet uh, exposing a lot of the so-called my myths of the Bible, sort of debunking, debunking the Bible. Um, and uh, someone close to, close to him said, you better burn that because, you know, and <laughs> the pamphlet was burned because it was considered a little bit scandalous. Um, and thereafter, he was quite cautious about expressing his view of the Bible, almost, almost like Thomas Jefferson, who clipped out all the supernatural um, references in the Bible because Jefferson was a deist, and didn't want to hear about the supernatural. And so just went through and, and, and made his own Bible. And uh, in a way, that's the way uh, Lincoln viewed the Bible, but um, he didn't want to be known as a scoffer, as a doubter. So when he ran against Peter Cartwright in 1846, um, 
he published a, a, a handbill uh, saying, no, I, I, I would never really support an outright scoffer of religion for public office. Someone who was a complete dismisser of the Bible. It was kind of a cautiously stated statement about the Bible. And um, he won that election. And from then on, he was very canny in his use of the Bible. He would quote from it left and right. And it's wrong to call him an atheist or even really an agnostic because uh, on some level, he really did believe in a divine force and in God. He just simply didn't believe in a particular creed or a particular church. Uh, and he said, if, if you could reduce if you could reduce every all religion just to the golden rule, rule, do unto others as you would have others do unto you, then that's the church that I would believe in. And he would sometimes go to church, uh, you know, with, with Mary. Uh, she went to the Presbyterian Church in Washington. Sometimes sit there and listen. So most often he didn't attend church with her, but sometimes he did. But he issued uh, nine proclamations of religion, religion or thanksgiving because during the Civil War, religion became a form of almost social unity or social healing for him. And these were never denominational things like, you know, you have to go to a Christian church or you have to go to this kind of church or whatever. They were more, more just statements of, of thanksgiving and prayer and so forth. So, yeah. I always, it, this is a good season to remember that, even though it's probably going to be not the Thanksgiving we're we're all used to in this country, but his thanks his idea of Thanksgiving was more fasting than feasting, so it was right. definitely a kind of a subservient one or a great, yeah. family, but not an abundant one that stressed abundance. But that's a great summary. Um, so as Lincoln sort of inculcates the culture, he reads something, but I don't know. He seemed he I've known people like this, and I one political leader for whom I worked was very much like this. He didn't seem to read that much, but he seemed to know everything that was in books and newspapers. I don't know whether, and I think part of it was that he would spend two hours every morning discussing what was in the papers and what was in books. So he didn't even have to read them. Lincoln strikes me as a little bit that way because he absorbs much more than he reads. We don't even know, for example, if he read Uncle Tom's Cabin, right? We know he read the, the, the right. background book. We, we, we certainly like to think that he did. And there was a well-worn copy in his office and everything like that, but we don't know for sure. But the point is, is that, and in general, he didn't particularly like novels. Right. You know, he liked, he read newspapers and he read uh, po poetry and, uh, and Shakespeare and so forth. He didn't particularly like novels. And yeah, I mean, he, his reading was not wide. He, I, I call him equidistant from John Quincy Adams, who was such a voracious reader that he knew six languages. And he was just, re he read the Bible in a different language every year, John Quincy Adams. Equidistant from that and Andrew Jackson. And the, the thing about Jackson is that, okay, he read the Bible, but other than that, he only got through one novel, The Vicar of Wakefield. Other, <laughs> he was, you know, he, he just didn't read at all. And Lincoln, he didn't have widespread reading, but what he read kind of stuck on his hard disk. So that if he were um, not at a cocktail party, because he didn't really attend cocktail parties, but if he were in company and sometimes he would just break out with a poem uh, and, or, or, or a passage from Shakespeare. And he did this not to, to brag, not to, to brag or, or something as one might do. Oh, I memorized this poem when I was in eighth grade. He did it because it meant something to him, this particular passage meant something, it struck an emotion uh, uh, you know, within him. And in a way it was a poetry for him was a way of channeling uh, expression and channeling feeling. That's why Shakespeare was so great to him because he knew how to channel and capture feeling just in a way that Lincoln himself really channeled cultural elements in his own uh, uh, treatment of, of politics and rhetoric like at, Get at Gettysburg where he kind of condenses everything to 272 words, you know, so much, so much meaning is kind of condensed and at the second in inaugural as, as, as well, yeah. 
but but you point out his. Ex I mean, I think you have to be gifted with that hard drive. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, he even says as a boy that when strangers would come to his cabin, you know, along the Cumberland Road where they lived and try to get a glass of whiskey or whatever they were stopping for, he would sit in his loft, his sleeping loft, and be fascinated by the adult conversation. And then he would remember it the next day. It's just a gift. Uh, yeah. So you describe, and, and this is, gets to the heart of the book, and I want to do your three boy, three Bs at, cer at a certain point because I love them. Um, but, but you describe the emerging personality of Lincoln, as someone who um, displays a sensitivity that sets him aside from the wild people in the region, the wild, the wrestlers and the eye gougers and the drinkers and the marauders and the, even the hunters. I mean, in an age of hunting for sport, he didn't hunt. Um, he would wrestle, but he didn't maim people. Um, he's, he sold liquor as a young man in his grocery <laughs> store, but he didn't drink. Um, he preached temperance, but he didn't condemn intemperate people. How does a man like that, who is so different, essentially, not only different looking, but apart from where the neighborhood is going, um, how does he fit in? And he obviously we know he fit in so successfully that his his townspeople elected him a captain in their militia unit, which he pleased him very much. And eventually, when he could campaign, they gave him almost all their votes in New Salem for the state legislature. I find it fasc fascinating that uh, you situate him as different, and yet he's widely accepted, which I find almost inex inexplicable. So I'll let you explain. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, what happens is early uh, in his Illinois years, um, he does become very popular with um, the kind of what were called the, the boys, uh, the uh, uh, kind of the, the gangs of that period, because um, a guy named Offit uh, makes a bet uh, uh, that Lincoln, you know, uh, can't can't beat uh, uh, this this local bully named Jack Armstrong, and Lincoln stands up for the bully, and the bully kind of cheat, cheats a little bit. We don't know exactly how, but uh, does uh, some kind of foul, and it, it's basically a draw, the wrestle. But it's amazing that Lincoln, who uh, he was tall and wiry, but this other guy was really a muscle man, and it's amazing that he did so well against this this Armstrong, but. That actually won the respect won the respect of a lot of the local average people. So when he goes to the Black Hawk War, the first thing that happens is that he is popular among these rough types, and he's elected the captain of his company. And even during the war, he wrestles a couple of strong men, uh, and he does pretty well. He gets beaten beaten by one of them. He gets thrown by one of them, but he beats another one. So he, he is able to kind of um, keep up with it, it, even though he's different, because as you said, uh, the goal of a lot of uh, wrestling in that day was to gouge out an eye or to chop off an ear with, with your uh, teeth, you know, like to, to, to bite off an ear. And he was not into that. He was into this scientific wrestling and so forth. But he was strong enough that he, and a good enough athlete that he, he really won the, uh, the hearts of a lot of people. And he also had a very common way of speaking. Uh, and he wore kind of odd clothing and he had what was called an assumed clownishness. There was almost a clownishness about him. And, and the boys liked to come on just sort of see him. They kind of liked his gangly, you know, awkward looks and so forth. And um, he did go through, if not quite a Donald Trump phase, and at least a phase in the 1830s of what was called slasher gaff rhetoric, slasher gaff, which was this sensational mocking kind of political rhetoric uh, that was kind of popular at that day, the era of Andrew Jackson and so forth. And uh, this kind of sensational back and forth, but that led to a duel. Uh, fortunately, the duel was called off <laughs> at the last moment, uh, unbeknownst to him, because uh, he chose uh, broadswords as the dueling, as the uh, weapon of, of choice. I don't think he knew that Shields, the guy he was dueling, was 
had been a fencing instructor. <laughs> I was very. We, I always we, say that the broadswords gave Lincoln the advantage because of his long arms, but I didn't know about uh, Shields' yeah, fencing uh, career. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so he he participates in this kind of sensational roughhousing culture, but then. In his 1842 temperance address, which is about alcohol, now he he wasn't a drinker himself because he said alcohol makes me feel makes me feel flabby and un, undone undone. I just don't enjoy it. He might sip, you know, just nurse a, a glass of wine if, if someone was around. Uh, but he said there's no reason why regular people can't just join the Alcoholics Anonymous movement. In that day, it was called the Washingtonian movement. And he gave, but he gave a speech in which he said, you know what? Um, we're all the same. Uh, these people, he wanted to avoid at that point using dark reform rhetoric, this kind of sensational rhetoric. And he said, we've had enough of this uh, saying, okay, the first drink will lead to murder. You're going to murder your wife and you're going to throw your kids out of the house and you're going to go straight to poverty. You know, people who are addicted are, are just like anybody else. We uh, uh, we should even join them and, and, and help each other. So I think that, that that's a moment of kind of a transitional moment toward a more persuasive kind of rhetoric. And at the end, he praises reason. You know, let's use reason and rationality and persuasion. And from then on, um, he learns how to use the, he, he doesn't totally surrender the jokes and all of that because he continues to tell a lot of stories and jokes and stuff, but uh, his rhetoric begins to make that shift a little bit toward eventually what eventually becomes the Gettysburg Address. Yeah. So, um, and I, let me um, apologize to, for, in behalf of politics and pros to a few people who sent messages that they are a little frustrated because they weren't able to get onto the Zoom uh, until a few minutes or 10 minutes even had passed. So. We are trying to cover territory here and we'll go a little longer than our allotted time so that everybody feels they have a full hour. We have two questions in the Q&A uh, uh, box here. We'll get to them eventually. I wanna to speak to David a little bit more. So if you have questions, if you didn't hear the announcement in the beginning, uh, put your question into the Q&A box on the bottom of your, of your laptops and we will try to address them. But David, you gave me an irresistible entry point when you talked about the Shields duel, because um, some say that it was fought uh, because Lincoln defended the honor and the anonymity of the author of the offending article that sent Shields over the top. And that was young Mary Todd with whom he had already broken up and gotten together with again. Um, and I just want to spend a little time on your breathtakingly revisionist portrait of Mary. I think we are gonna hear a lot about that in the, in the weeks to come from people who, who differ with you. Um, I must say, I've always been sympathetic to Mary. Um, I, I mean, too much is expected of her, of her in my judgment. And, and um, uh, I think some of the stories of her malfeasance and her you know, insidiousness are over, overdone, but you paint a, you make her into kind of a feminist, uh, 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 you know, uh, original feminist, uh, not quite in the movement for women's rights because that involved radical things like free love and equality for black people at the time. But as someone who is seeking a place in the world by dint of her experience in education and at the very least functioning as an advisor and you also, uh, you push back against the long held theory that the presidency drove them apart, even though they were finally living in the, and working in the same building. You argue that it in fact brought them together in some major ways. So um, I think we should talk a little bit about the marriage and about Mary. For sure, for sure. There is no, no, no doubt um, that Mary was idiosyncratic, temperamental, uh, William Herndon called her the hell, hellcat of the age, the hellcat. Uh, she was intensely disliked by uh, the male secretaries, Nicolet and, and uh, Hay uh, and so forth. 
Um, having said that, uh, and it's possible that she was bipolar. That's, uh, you know, sometimes she, uh, they, they, people say that, that, that she's bipolar. And there were certainly moments, particularly after Willie died, that she went into almost a, you know, a period of catatonia and, and, and irrationality. She, she could be quite irrational. Having said that, um, she did go to a boarding school for 10 or private school for 10 years. The average uh, um, education for women was roughly four to five years. And she knew French very fluently. Not that that qualifies her as a feminist, but she, uh, uh, I do compare her a little bit to Jessie Fremont, who was multilingual and very intelligent as well. And also very politically involved. Uh, she kind of half jokingly said as a young girl, even well, someday I'm gonna marry a president of the United, United States. You know, she, she would say that and people would say, no, 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 you know, she'd say, yeah, I'm going to. And uh, she was in the same company as Henry Clay because his father in Kentucky knew Henry Clay. Henry Clay was Lincoln's beau ideal of a statesman. And um, she became uh, eventually, even though she was raised in, in a slave holding family, she became eventually uh, quite committed to, to abolitionism. And um, she said, which I think is wrong, that she was even more abolitionist than her husband. Eventually she said more abolitionist than, than Abe. I, I think that's incorrect. But she got to the point uh, during the presidency when um, she had seven uh, relatives who were on the side of the Confederacy because her father remarried and that whole second marriage produced Confederate soldiers, people who were fighting for the Confederacy. And when some of them died, uh, she said, I was, close to, I was close to them once, but frankly, I don't care. They would have killed my husband uh, if, they, if, if they were near him, they would, they would have killed him. And they're not devoted to his cause whatsoever. So she, she became really devoted to her husband's cause uh, and to him. I think that were they separated in the White House? Well, they've been separated beforehand because on the law circuit, he was gone to up to uh, four, mo four months at a time, four months at a time. Uh, so she was kind of alone um, and she made uh, women friends and sometimes men would come over to the house and so forth. So what I'm saying is that there was a sense of independence there uh, that is sometimes I think underplayed uh, if we merely dismiss her as let's say a mentally ill person who gave Lincoln just untold grief or something like that. So yeah, yeah. You did give him status for sure when they married. Yeah, yeah. Elevated his position in the world. And her, you point out that uh, her father, uh, a slave owner, but a Whig, provided them some money. I mean, he supported, he underwrote them for uh, a good part of the time. And but you also say that he wasn't particularly close to his father-in-law. Uh, took some of his, his father gave him his legal cases, some legal business. It's a great, it's an interesting portrait. As I say, there, I know there are books in the works about how Mary was, uh, you know, evil incarnate. So I'm, I'm happy to have this out there as a, a preview uh, uh, counterbalance. So I, I want to, I, I want to skip before we go to the questions. I want to get to a part of the book or parts really. I'm compressing them where you address, um, um, as you put it, Blondine, the tightrope walker. Everyone pronounces that in different ways, but I, I'm eager to hear how you pronounce it. Barnum, the Barnum culture, which you put Lincoln in, in some regard, and the boys, uh, I hope I'm saying that right, the, the, uh, the wild boys who, and how Lincoln took young America from his rival Stephen Douglas and convinced them that he was the person to be followed. So Blondine I think is maybe the most important aspect because you very convincingly return to the idea that Lincoln in seeking moderation and in seeking balance is, is, is it's a great metaphor because, and Blondine was a celebrity of the age. He was the famous tightrope walker that crossed Niagara Falls with a, you know, a, someone on his head, uh, a filing cabinet in his arms, all sorts of things, and never fell, as far as I know. 
um, unlike the Walendas who do fall. <laughs> but Lincoln, just give us your take on the Blondine aspect of Lincoln's career and the culture. Yeah, Blondine, or I call him Blonde, and he was, uh, that wasn't his real name, but uh, he's a I know, stage. so why should we torture ourselves with the Yeah, yeah, uh, okay, Blonde. Yeah, he made many crossings in 1859, crossings of Niagara Falls, 1,200 feet across, and uh, no, no net, no net. And he would carry a man across. He did it on four-foot stilts. He did it on stilts. He did it backwards. Uh, he did it... <laughs> pushing a wheelbarrow, pushing a wheelbarrow filled with items and everything. So he became pretty amazing and very, very popular. And Lincoln more than once, several times compared himself to, uh, to Blondin. Uh, and uh, when people used to come to him and say, why won't you make this more of a specifically anti-slavery war, anti-slavery war, the civil war more specifically anti-slavery from the beginning. He said, look, if I were Blondin and I was pushing the whole nation in a wheelbarrow, the whole nation's future, would you tell me step left, step right, jump up, jump down? No, no, you would let me just proceed across. And cartoonists often portrayed him as, as, as Blondin. Uh, they showed him pushing. Right. Yeah, yeah, in, in tights and, and uh, without a shirt on and all of that stuff. So yeah. And it really speaks to his centrism because he thought, particularly during the Civil War, if he said the wrong thing, uh, or if, for example, he didn't uh, cancel Fremont's emancipation order in Missouri, he could easily maybe lose one of the border states. Border states were slaveholding states, and yet they were still loyal to the North, to the Union. And he said, you know, if I lose Kentucky, we're going to lose everything. If he said the wrong thing, and um, so a lot of the radical abolitionists like Wendell Phillips and everything, Wendell Phillips would mock him. Oh, he's just a blonde and he's a equivocator. He's too much of a balancer. He's too much of a, so he was attacked from the left and from the right, uh, very sharply attacked from the right. He was attacked as virtually what we would call AOC or whatever, or beyond Black Lives Matter from the left. He was attacked as, as whoever, Jim Jordan, or <laughs> take your pick of the you know, Republican senators. But he really wanted to keep right in the middle uh, because he thought the worst thing that I can do at a very divided time is, is what we would say, pour, pour gasoline on the flames of division. He really believed that, that that's the worst thing that you could do at a divided time. And on the Barnum uh, metaphor, you you place him firmly in the culture of spectacle, and, and not just because um, he invited Tom Thumb and Barnum and Mrs. General Tom Thumb to the White House, but be, and, and not because he was freakish in his, in him, uh, but borderline. He was a spectacle in himself. And I, I, I want to give you a chance to expound on the Barnum. Uh, yeah, Barnum was the great exhibitor of what they called in that era, freak, freaks or oddities. We, we don't use those words nowadays, of course we don't. But uh, including Tom Thumb, who was two feet, feet six and so forth. And, uh, a woman who supposedly was 161 years old and she had been the nanny <laughs> of George Washington and the Fiji mermaid who was uh, a half woman and a half fish. She was just a monkey's torso tied to a salmon's tail, a salmon's tail and suspended in water. But anyway, so Barnum- more, more perniciously though, the what is it, which was supposedly oh, the what? ape half human and was you know, really a horrible racist. Uh, it, it was a very racist. They, they uh, took a young teenage African-American who had a slightly misshapen skull and they said that he was the missing link, the missing link yeah. between uh, the, the ape and the human being. It was a, it was a terrible uh, kind of ra racist. Was, but they used him in a political cartoon, of course, where Lincoln is contemplating how fortunate we are that this wonderful specimen of humanity will be my successor if I'm elected. Yes, uh, and, and they presented this in the cartoon. I re reproduced this in my book and several other 
cartoons in which he's put on spectacle in kind of a Barnum exhibit, quite often from a disadvantageous point of view. But there was an advantageous uh, a, a use of him as spectacle as well. He himself played up his kind of homeliness. He wasn't really that homely if you look at his picture, but he kind of played it up a little bit because in a way that was part of uh, the spectacle, like the, the odd looking politician, gangly and a cavernous face and all of that. And also the spectacle of the rail, rail splitter because by 1860, when he was running for president, he wasn't really that much connected to a rail splitter background. He had become a lawyer uh, wearing pretty good suits, you know, nice suits and everything and the way Brady presents him. But uh, he was put on spectacle really as the rail splitter with his sleeves rolled up in short sleeve, open shirt and wielding an ax and so, uh, and log cabins everywhere and so forth. So he was really almost put on a Barnum at Barnumus spectacle as, as Abe, as Abe. Useful, of course, for him. Yeah, very and, useful, yeah. And, and would you agree that he adds to the, to the spectacle by wearing the tallest stovepipe hats he can get his hands on? And, <laughs> and he's probably, yeah. probably seven foot two with the hat. Um, yeah, and, and what, what's curious is that the Bahois, um, maybe I can transition into them. Mm -hmm. They loved to ape upper or imitate upper class or middle class. And they, these were the workers, the, the uh, butcher, butchers, the carpenters, the, the, the average workers of the day. The, and uh, they were known as the Bahois. Walt Whitman was known as the Bahoy poet because he poses one of the roughs. Whitman was not one of the roughs whatsoever, but he poses as one of the roughs and he was known as the Bahoy poet. But the Bahoy's liked to wear the, the kind of stovepipe hats and Whitman wanted to win over what he called the shrewd wild boys, the shrewd, you know, they were the Bahoy's, he wanted to win them over. And he partly succeeded because of the kind of spectacle of, of the tall hat and uh, the kind of sloppy clothing that he sometimes wore and even his love of Shakespeare. The, the Bahois were known both to be, they love to tell jokes and stories, but they also liked to go to Shakespeare as well. They were what was known as cute, which, in that, which meant acute, shrewd, you know, he called them the shrewd wild boys. So in a way he wanted to be, and indeed uh, he wrote that, that lecture about young America and young America is the current, the current thing right now. And he really sucked in young America. Yeah. From there, was, there was a little Douglas. sarcasm in that lecture. Yeah, a little sarcasm. At that point. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, yeah. I mean, but you're right, because at the, by the 1860 campaign, you have boys marching at night, uh, carrying torches and morphing into a, uh, a, a, a formal organization that actually frightened the South and made them think that there was a militarization of those boys. So he was- Yeah, because they used to dress up in these semi-military coats and everything, and semi-military hats and march and uh, march around. And indeed the first uh, martyr of the Civil War who was Elmer Ellsworth, uh, who was this, uh, he had been a law student with Lincoln and then he became a drill master. But Lincoln, he accompanied Lincoln on the train back to Washington uh, in 1861. And then Lincoln wanted to actually appoint him as uh, sort of a major organizer of the troops because he was very, he was a, a very short guy, but he could draw the respect of even the most rough people. And uh, Lincoln said, will you go draw a, a regiment together? And he, the first place he went were among the Bahois of New York. He went to the, the bars, the saloons. These are all the brawling uh, roughhousers. And we go up to them. As I say, he, he looked like a meek guy, but they all became his pet lambs. The Bahois became his pet lambs, Ellsworth's pet lambs, and he marched down out of New York City down to Washington, and he helped. He was one of the regiments that helped uh, to uh, save Washington uh, at a time when it was un under threat. It was under threat. And, and as you, you write a wonderful chapter, we probably should go to questions in a minute, but you do write a wonderful chapter about uh, Ellsworth as the first martyr of the Civil War on the Union side and, a, and a, a loss keenly felt by the Lincoln family as if he was as if he was their own son. 
sometimes I think that Lincoln would have preferred Ellsworth as a, uh, or John Hay as his son to the son, the older son he had, but we won't get into that psychology. Yeah. We've got to so let me, let me get to some of our viewer questions because they've been very patient. So we have one question from John Willen, who I know is a infectious disease doctor. So he is like a hero. Uh, and he's been advising people in Washington about the right thing to do for months. He says is not, oh, I see, this is a leading question. Is not the fact that Lincoln named his fourth son Thomas evidence that there was some degree of respect for his father? That's a good question. What do you think, Dave? Yeah, I, I, I think that's true. Um, that's a good point. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Tad, uh, he called him Tad, but his name was Thomas. Yeah, uh, I, I was, I, I assume that that is true, that that shows retrospective uh, respect for, for his father. Yeah, yeah. I don't think Tad ever met his grandfather, though. Uh, Mary no. kind of kept them apart. There's a letter that Mary wrote to uh, her husband's stepmother after the assassination in which she writes, uh, my little boy is named, you may not know this, but our youngest is named Thomas for your husband, which certainly indicates the distance that at least Mary had put between that prairie culture and herself. Right, right. So we have a question from Joy Basu, who says, First, he sa she says, thank you, which is nice. And then she says, could you share a few things that traditional history has perhaps missed or misconstrued that your cultural biography clarifies or corrects? Not only a good question, but an alliterative one too. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, well, we mentioned, uh, I don't know whether, um, this questioner came in late, but we did mention the portrait of the father, Thomas, who traditionally is um, portrayed rather neg negatively uh, in, in biography. And uh, not that I portray him as being flawless, but I do try to adjust that picture. And in, in fact, Lincoln's entire childhood, I, I, I give a slightly more optimistic spin on that than frankly most uh, most uh, Lincoln biographers or historians do. Um, secondly, I think there, particularly lately, uh, there's been big confusion about Lincoln and race, racial issues. Um, and there's one historian who says that racism was at the very core of Lincoln's being. And I say that we can only determine that by going back and re reconstructing the era in which he lived. And in Illinois, uh, in 1853, there was passed a law that was, uh, Frederick Douglass call, uh, called uh, the most severe black, black law in America, in which free African Americans were not allowed to uh, uh, settle in the state. No, no additional free African Americans were allowed to, to enter the state without a $500 fine or going to jail. I mean, it's a very racist environment. So, Lincoln, and then when he went in the Lincoln-Douglas debates, he had to tailor his language to some degree to, to Stephen Douglas, about whom Frederick Douglas said, <clears throat> no one has done more damage to African Americans than Stephen Douglas, who had this public stage and he was thoroughgoing racist. racist. So Lincoln, if you, you can cherry pick uh, certain aspects of, uh, you know, oh, I, I never thought that African Americans could serve on juries or vote or something like that. But uh, he was trying, he was running for Senate in an atmosphere that was really largely conservative. Uh, and he had to somewhat measure his um, uh, uh, statement, public statements. That, but eventually, as I show, um, he gained, he was very close to, to black people in Springfield because where he lived, his neighborhood had, uh, there were 21 African Americans living in his neighborhood. He, he became quite close to several of them, particularly his barber, uh, William Florville or William de Fleurville. Uh, and there were a couple of others that he, that he became close to as well. Then. And then uh, when he went to the White House, uh, he tried to help out um, a guy named Johnson who had come from Springfield you know, uh, to Washington. 
And he also met secretly with Frederick Douglass uh, twice. And the first time Douglass was a little bit dubious about him, but the second time Douglass was kind of stunned because uh, Lincoln said, you know, I really want the vote for African-Americans and I would like you actually, could I appoint you to go down into the South and be a scout to inform enslaved people of the fact that I passed the Emancipation Proclamation because a lot of people down there don't know about it. And then a little bit later, he met with Sojourner Truth, uh, this aged African-American feminist, and she had a very delightful visit with him. And then Martin Delaney, who was uh, a real activist. He, today, he would be beyond Black Lives Matter, and, and he was a real, real uh, you know, a Afrocentric person. And he became quite close to Lincoln, so much so that when Lincoln was assassinated, uh, 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 Delaney cried like, like a baby. He cried like a baby for, for like a long time. And he wanted to do a, a monument to Lincoln. The monument was going to be of an African woman st starting to stand up with tears running down her, four million tears running down her face. And it was supposed to be paid for by the four, me four million previously enslaved people uh, that uh, Lincoln had helped to set free. Uh, and as so, we know, the, ultimately, the the freedmen contributed to a statue that showed a uh, an African American man either kneeling or rising, and that's become the object of uh, some contention. Yeah, and see, I that came along, and, and it, that was paid for by freedmen, but that's that's the way they they felt. That was in 1876, uh, a few you know years after the Civil War, but they, they came uh, came along, and and now the statue is saying. Oh, uh, it doesn't give enough emp empowerment to African Americans because this person is is kneeling and getting up and so forth. It's not not really no no. You, you have to you have to recreate the entire racial issue back in that era. You really do. I think we have time for one more question, then I will ask. Um, and it's nice that I'm I'm so interactive, not but interactive enough that I just received a note from Joy Basu, who really liked the answer to the question. So that's oh, nice to get a quick response. Um, uh, we have a, one more question that I want to cover from Thomas Link, who, um, who, who, who I know, and I know is working on a dramatization about the Cooper Union address. And he's kind of asking both of us, um, well, I think I've expressed myself on this in my book, but the significance of Mr. Lincoln's Cooper Union speech on the culture uh, in 1860. David, well, yeah, uh, you, you address this to some degree in your book. I address it to some degree. Um, he, both he and you and I say that Cooper Union made him president to well, Kate, Cooper Union, Brady, and I would say Abe, <laughs> the image of Abe, made yeah. him president. Uh, if you combine those those, those uh, elements, and maybe a little bit of Barnum and, and, and Bohois as well, uh, Cooper Union, um, the effect that it had was that it was very very persuasive um, interpretation of the founding fathers as being fundamentally anti-slavery, in spite of everything, in spite of the fact that some of them held slaves, held held people in slavery, in spite of the fact that you can interpret the Constitution from one perspective as a pro-slavery document. That they, they, and they made a very rational case for that. And also a very, and he kind of distanced himself. I wrote a book about John Brown, but he distanced himself from vigilante action like John Brown's. He said, you know, we didn't have a Republican person there at Harper's Ferry. There was no Republican there with John Brown. And if the Republican Party came to power, we would be against the kind of vigilante uh, uh, action, uh, the individual kind of uh, military action that John Brown represented. And so he presents a very kind of moderate and rational point of view that is very, very persuasive. And I think the uh, influence on the general general culture at that moment, for me, is in a way to, at least temporarily, to calm the waters a little bit and to make people think 
a little bit more rationally about it. And I think to sway people who read it because it was widely reprinted, it was widely reprinted the Cooper Union. I think it uh, entered this voice of kind of reason and moderation uh, and also a sense of morality in terms of slavery into the cultural conversation. Is that kind of the way you view it, Harold? Yeah, uh, I'm just going to add a David Reynolds-like observation. You, you handled all the stuff that I would ordinarily say. I would simply add that, that in presenting himself as a cultured legal thinker, um, he punctures the, the mythology that's grown since the Lincoln-Douglas debates that he's a, you know, a frontier debater and prowls the stage and plays to the crowd. He was so legalistic, so formal, so rousing in the end, in the last section, that I think he just, he, he, he worked against an image that might have been seen as negative in, New, in the New York elite. So that, that would be what my, I would add. But you, you just, part of your answer dealt with John Brown. And I did just want to acknowledge that David Kent has asked a question about what Lincoln thought of John Brown. Does, do you want to add anything to that? It, aside from what he said at Cooper Union? It's a complicate, complicated, kind of unknowable thing. Well, yeah, I mean, he fundamentally, uh, he spoke about John Brown a couple of times uh, in Kansas, no less. And he, he, was said, there when the, he was there when the execution When happened. the execution took place, yeah. And he said, uh, John Brown had a generous heart. We agree with him uh, on slavery, uh, in his, his point of view on slavery. We, we agree with him. But what he did was against the law. It was against the law. And um, he really believed that ballots, not bullets, ballots, not bullets, were the answer. And at the time, he was thinking that it could take some time. It could take um, a fair amount of time for slavery to disappear. Uh, in 1858, he said it could take 50 years. It could even take 100 years. But he wanted to go through the electoral process. And whereas John Brown was very Im immediate. He wanted immediate um, action and immediate, an immediate cure. And he, uh, Brown fantasized about causing a slave rebellion that was going to cause the overthrow of, uh, of slavery. But John Brown represented the higher law, like uh, John Brown wrote his own version of the Constitution, his own Constitution, his own version of the Declaration of Independence. So John Brown uh, really wanted to mold the Constitution to his anti slavery viewpoint. And Lincoln tried tried to keep within the Constitution as much as possible and within the electoral process, as much political process as much as possible. So that's really the, uh, the major difference. Uh, Even though this you raised a really good point about the Kansas remarks. I'm actually think it was pretty daring of him and risky of him to say he had a generous heart in a territory where John Brown had been accused by pro-slavery people of, of murder. And the evidence is there is that he killed a lot of people in Kansas. So it was it was not a conservative statement, even to concede his his generosity and his right thinking. So and and uh, when he was elected president, his opponent said the presidential office is now occupied occupied by a vulgar partisan of John Brown. And even after the war, uh, sour grape Southerners said that. Uh, John Brown has taken over America in the person of Abraham Lincoln, uh, the memory of Abraham Lincoln. So there were, to his opponents, he was, as I say, beyond AOC, beyond Black Lives Matter. He was like John Brown, you know. Uh, right. Just as, yeah. So I want, I'm going to close with um, a, a question that's, and I don't know if you know this, but you closed your book with uh, a bit of poetry with which I opened a book that I did last year on the life of Daniel Chester French. Um, and that's the, 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 the wonderful poetry about the Lincoln Memorial, uh, a, a, a statue that is beyond reproach, I suppose, uh, although it suffered some indignities during the demonstrations that followed the murder of George Floyd. There was a little bit of graffiti and rumors about further destruction. but. Um, I just want to turn to the recent incident in, in Portland at which um, 
people toppled a statue of Lincoln. Um, and and it, it was interesting, it was not about Lincoln and African Americans. The complaint was about Lincoln and Native Americans, uh, American Indians. And it, so I think it would be useful if we close, I, because I think we both agree on this, the episode of, of uh, Lincoln's permitting the, the biggest mass execution in, in American history, but also pardoning a huge number of people who had been condemned to death. So it's a very interesting way to balance the result. And I have spoken in St. Paul, Minnesota on a couple of occasions, and that was, it is, this execution is always brought up by indigenous people who come to these events, and it's a tough one. So how do you, how do we measure Lincoln and indigenous people? And maybe you can close with Lincoln and monuments and memorials. Oh, for sure, yeah. Well, uh, you know, his grandfather was, um, uh, you know, uh, killed by a Native American and so forth. He was raised on the frontier and anti-Native American sentiment was kind of part of the DNA of white Americans of that, of that era. Um, what happened in that incident was that there was a, an uprising uh, among the, the Sioux Indians out in Minnesota, and uh, they went on kind of a, uh, they, they had been cheated, cheated left and right, and, and just maltreated for so long, and they got very, very anxious and upset, and, and they made an uprising. Uh, and there were a number, a fair number of, of white people living there that, that, that were killed, that were killed. But um, over, th well over 300 uh, Native Americans were convicted and were uh, uh, slated to, to hang, to be, to be executed. Uh, but Lincoln had been a lawyer and he said, no, 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 let me see the papers. And he carefully went over the, with, with a couple of other people. He went over the papers of each case and he, he whittled it down from well over 300 to 30, 38, 38. And he thought that these were cases that really showed excessive and needless violence uh, in a couple of cases against women and so forth and children. And he said, um, now if he had let everyone totally free, all the natives, then he would have been very, very severely attacked. He thought that some justice should be done. He tried to regulate, he tried to reform Indian affairs, but unfortunately the agents under him, frankly, were fairly racist people. And he did invite a number of chiefs and, and, and you know, uh, Native Americans to the White House and he tried to address them and so forth. And he said, I try to do well, but my children, in other words, his agents, don't treat treat you very well. Uh, and unfortunately, a couple of the Native Americans who came to the White House actually were slaughtered, uh, went back home and they were slaughtered by, by, by white agents and so forth. So it was a me messy, messy situation, but if you take 300 and uh, over 300 people and uh, that could have been executed and he at least brought it down to 38, it was a terrible situation, but still, um, Again, it's a situation where you have to see it in context to really understand it. So I take it you are um, comfortable and enthusiastic about the hundreds and hundreds of statues of Abraham Lincoln remaining in place. Oh, absolutely. They, they should re remain untouched uh, in place. I have a little more problem with, with some of the Confederate statues. I think that, oh, I don't know, some black plaques should be put on them or so red sign or something or whatever or or maybe move to a confederate museum as a piece of his, history or something but and and lincoln hated the confederate flag and all of that so i i wouldn't i don't like seeing that flying around about state houses so yeah but but lincoln statues no they they should remain untouched really untouched well um I thank you not only for this conversation, but for producing a book that everyone who claims to be conversant in all things Lincoln will have to add to their bookshelf and read. 
I enjoyed reading it very much. Um, it's a big Thank book you. and lots to chew on and we've only scratched the surface. So congratulations to you, David. And um, I thank everyone who's joined us today. I thank everybody for turning out and thank you so much, uh, Harold. I admire your work on Lincoln so much, Lincoln and the Civil War. And uh, yeah, um, I hope a lot of people will, will uh, buy it from Politics and Prose uh, bookstore, you know, which would Indeed. be great. Yeah. Thanks everyone. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.